Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. The Federal Reserve raises interest rates a quarter of a percent, continuing the year-long string of rate hikes to reduce high inflation, but this time a smaller increase than the recent ones, and this coming two weeks after two bank failures in the U.S. Fed Chair Jerome Powell saying today the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient, and changing the language a bit about possible schedule for future interest rate increases. Just ahead, we'll hear from the chairman and talk with MarketWatch senior reporter Greg Robb. CEO of pharmaceutical company Moderna telling the Senate committee why the price of its COVID-19 vaccine will quadruple to about $130 per dose once the government stops being the sole purchaser this year with the end of the national health emergency. Both Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and a resident of East Palestine, Ohio, testifying before another Senate committee today about fears and concerns, both health-related and economic, that are still present following the train derailment and toxic chemical spill and fire back in February. Secretary of State Antony Blinken goes before a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on the President's fiscal year 2023 budget request for foreign operations, getting questions about divisions in the Republican Party over aid to Ukraine to help Ukraine fight off Russia's military invasion, and also questions about the U.S.-Mexico border and drug smuggling. And at the Supreme Court, a case that pits First Amendment right to make fun of a commercial product against the company's trademark protection, not to have consumers confused by the knockoff. In this case, a dog toy named Bad Spaniels parodying whiskey maker Jack Daniels. From NBC News, the Federal Reserve is raising its key interest rate by 0.25 percent, continuing its crusade against inflation while warning that recent instability in financial markets after a series of historic bank collapses could weigh on the economy. In announcing their ninth consecutive rate hike, Fed officials said in a statement Wednesday that the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient, but they warned that recent developments, likely a reference to the market turmoil since several lenders around the world have stumbled or failed, are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses and to weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. That reporting from from NBC News. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell announcing the rate hike and the comments about the banking sector at a news conference today. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point, bringing the target range to four and three quarters to five percent. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. Since our previous FOMC meeting, economic indicators have generally come in stronger than expected, demonstrating greater momentum in economic activity and inflation. We believe, however, that events in the banking system over the past two weeks are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, which would in turn affect economic outcomes. It is too soon to determine the extent of these effects, and therefore too soon to tell how monetary policy should respond. As a result, we no longer state that we anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate to quell inflation. Instead, we now anticipate that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. We will closely monitor incoming data and carefully assess the actual and expected effects of tighter credit conditions on economic activity, the labor market, and inflation. And our policy decisions will reflect that assessment. In our SCP, each FOMC participant wrote down an appropriate path for the federal funds rate based on what that participant judges to be the most likely scenario going forward. If the economy evolves as projected, the median participant projects that the appropriate level of the federal funds rate will be 5.1% at the end of this year, 4.3% at the end of 2024, and 3.1% at the end of 2025. These are little changed from our December projections, reflecting offsetting factors. These projections are not a committee decision or plan. If the economy does not evolve as projected, the path for policy will adjust as appropriate to foster our maximum employment and price stability goals. We will continue to make our meeting decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, part of his opening statement at a news conference today at the Fed headquarters in Washington, D.C. One of the questions from the reporters was about banking oversight and the review of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. 
Hi, Chair Powell, Gina Smilik from the New York Times. Thank you for taking our questions. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, I know that you've got your internal review coming, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think happened with oversight at Silicon Valley Bank and whether this suggests that something about regulation and supervision needs to actually change going forward. And I wonder, you know, how can the American people have confidence that there aren't other weaknesses out there in the banking system, given that this one got missed, as you noted? So let me, let me say what, what, what I think happened, and then I'll come to the questions around supervision. So at a basic level, uh, Silicon Valley Bank management failed badly. They, they grew the bank very quickly. They exposed the bank to significant liquidity risk and interest rate risk, didn't hedge that risk. We now know that supervisors uh, saw these risks and, and intervened. We know that the public saw all this. Um, we know that SVB experienced an unprecedentedly rapid and massive bank run. So this is, a, this is a very large group of connected depositors, concentrated group of connected depositors, and a very, very fast run, faster than the historical record would suggest. So um, for, as for us, so for our part, we're doing a review of supervision and regulation. My only interest is that we identify what went wrong here. How did this happen, is the question. What went wrong? Try to find that. We will find that. And then make an assessment of what are the right policies to put in place so that it doesn't happen again, and then implement those policies. It would be inappropriate for me at this stage to offer my views on what the answers might be. You know, I, I simply can't do that. Vice Chair Barr is leading this, and uh, I think he's testifying next week. So, uh, but that will be up to him. So that's really where it is. That, you know, the. Um, the review is going to be thorough and transparent. Uh, uh, it, it is clear, to your, really to your last question, it's clear that we, we do need to strengthen supervision and regulation. Uh, and I, I assume that uh, you know, there will be recommendations coming out of the report, and I, I plan on supporting them and supporting their implementation. Sorry, just And the final point, you know, can we feel confident that these weaknesses don't exist elsewhere, given that they got missed at this bank? These are not weaknesses that are, that are at all broadly through the banking system. This was, a, this was a bank that was an outlier in terms of both its percentage of, of, uh, of, um, of uninsured deposits and in, in terms of its uh, holdings of duration risk. And again, supervisors did get in there, and, and they were, as you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were on this issue, but nonetheless, this, this still happened. And, and so that's really the nature of the interview, of, sorry, of the review is to discover that. With more on the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell's news conference, joining us on the phone is Greg Robb, senior reporter for Market Watch. Thank you for being on Washington today. So everyone looking to how the banking situation might affect the Federal Reserve's approach to bringing down high inflation, a little suspense going in. What are your takeaways from the news conference? This is an interesting press conference, Michael. I think the... Uh the key message from Fed Chairman Powell is, well, they raised interest rates a little bit more, but Powell said that the banking crisis really has them watching the economy, and they may need to raise interest rates more, but sort of open the door that they may not. Uh, that's because the banking, stress in the banking sector kind of leads to or could lead to um, pullback of banks lending. Um, banks will be hoarding their cash. And if banks pull back, there's been the past we've had to deal with these credit crunches where people can't get loans and then the economy kind of can stall out. And that's a concern. So when they tighten these standards, it kind of slows the economy. And then that means the Fed doesn't have to raise rates as much. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell more than 500 points today. Did they, the investors not like what they heard? I mean, the people, our, our staff that I was talking to put a lot of, of blame for that, or the reason for that was uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was testifying to the Senate panel at, kind of at the same time as Powell, and, just, and she sort of seemed to take off the table this idea of blanket deposit insurance that had been kind of bandied about in financial markets. Just to, you know, everybody has... If you have $250,000 in the bank, it's insured by the FDIC. Above that, it's not insured. But when they Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, they they kind of gave that insurance to everyone. 
even over 250000 and there had been talk that they were going to move that to every depositor. It's kind of a – it's not the easiest thing. It's kind of not a wild idea, but it's a, it's a intense – it would be something completely different for Washington. So, But it's sort of been gathering steam, but it looks like Yellen kind of pulled the plug on that. I guess the market like that um, – that's what that's what my people are telling me. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell opened his news conference by saying the banking system is sound. What role does the Fed play in bank oversight? We don't often hear about that during his regular news conferences. Yeah, we don't. It's kind of in the background a little bit. It's interesting. During the in 2008, when we had the great financial crisis um, and the banks failed because they bought too many um, asset-backed mortgage securities, the mortgages and the housing market itself. The banking system really did collapse in some sense. And regulators in Washington were trying to figure out what to do. And they gave, there was a talk about not having the Fed be a bank regulator, but at the end of the day, they decided to make the Fed the bank regulator. So the Fed has a lot of responsibility for monitoring banks Silicon Valley Bank, the bank that uh, had to be taken over and that collapsed, was completely regulated by the Fed, head to toe, one analyst said. So the Fed has, um, you know, a black eye from this. And um, so that is what Powell is grappling with. He said that he wants to get to the bottom of it. He said it had a lot to do with the management of the company and that um, he thought that rules and supervision need to be improved. We're talking with Greg Robb from Market Watch. Back to the interest rate hike, a quarter of a percentage point. Ahead of today's announcement, you wrote an article laying out the pros and cons of that amount. What are those pros and cons, and why did the Fed choose to go this route? Well, it, it, the, it's a quarter point. It was either a quarter point move, or some people were asking, were thinking that the Fed would not raise rates at all, right? That they would just hold them steady until the smoke cleared from the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but the Fed went ahead with a quarter-point move. Many economists thought that it was um, going to be a mistake, and they still think it's a mistake because they think that it, this could um, make credit, make the banking system, which hasn't really kind of calmed down well, since Silicon Valley Bank failed 12 days ago, that this would kind of exacerbate that. But and many other people thought that the Fed should go forward and sort of have a stiff upper lip and project confidence in the economy, saying the economy could handle it. And Powell tried, I think, to say that the banking system was sound and sort of hinted that the, it, was a, it was only a few banks that were in trouble. And that he, but he also at the same time said the Fed would kind of do whatever it takes to keep an eye on, on the banking sector. Um, it's kind of a tough message. Um, but that was the reason. So we'll see how that we'll see how it plays out. Um, you know, but they did decide to go ahead. But they, he also said that this might be their last, or maybe one more. So we're kind of getting to the end of it. Rate the high end of rates is five percent. They were zero last year, so they've come up a lot. Um, so that's where we are right now. And then we're just going to have to see how things progress over the next six weeks. And the final question, the the whole point of raising the interest rates was to deal with high inflation. I believe that the Fed chair said during his news conference that we will get back to 2% inflation at some point. What is the economic outlook here? No, inflation is not looking great. It, it We sort of had high hopes at the end of last year that it was coming down pretty well. And then we had some we had a bad month of data at the beginning of the year. You know, we'll have to see that getting back to 2% is going to be really hard, according to most economists. Inflation gets really sticky. People kind of like being able to raise prices for their goods and especially their services. Whenever somebody comes to your house to mow the lawn or do some work, they're going to want more money. That's kind of hard to stop once it gets started. And it seems to have been where we are in the economy now. The, the sense most of the economists I talk to was that they can get inflation down to around somewhere in the 3 to 4% range, but that getting it down further is going to take some work. Uh, whether we go into a recession now because of the Silicon Valley Bank and all the crises and the 
bank lending. That might bring inflation down too. So we'll have to see. But the outlook for inflation is, you know, grim. Um, and now on top of it, we have this banking tremors in the banking sector. And so that's why Powell's, you know, press conference today and everything they did was, you know, he was really on the hot seat. Greg Robb, senior reporter for Market Watch. His stories at marketwatch.com and on Twitter at grob 2000 Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And closing on Wall Street today, the Dow down 530, NASDAQ down 190, S&P down 65. U.S. Senate hearing today from the CEO of Moderna on that company's plans to raise the price of its COVID-19 vaccine when it shifts to commercial distribution rather than selling only to the federal government. That's going to happen in May with the end of the COVID-19 and public health emergency. Moderna tells the Wall Street Journal that the price of the vaccine will be about $130 a dose. It has been about $25 a dose when the government has been paying. And the government then, of course, made them available to the American public at no cost. The CEO of Moderna, Stefan Bansell, justifying the increase in his opening statement to the Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee. We are committed to ensuring anyone who wants a vaccine can get one without price being a barrier. Until now, the U.S. government has purchased and distributed the vaccine. Now Moderna, a small company, must ensure that anyone who wants a vaccine can get one at a location convenient to them. With this role comes increased complexity and increased risk. In the pandemic market, we had one customer, the U.S. government. In the endemic market, we're going to have 10,000 customers. In the pandemic market, the U.S. government took the risk for wasted doses. In the endemic market, Moderna will take that risk and that cost. In the pandemic market, we only had to deliver to three CDC warehouses. In the endemic market, we're going to have to manage logistics to deliver to 60,000 pharmacies, doctor's office, and hospital. In the pandemic market, we had one vial with 10 doses in there. In the endemic market, what the market requires is single dose vial, or even better, pre-filled syringe. On top of all this, we're expecting a 90%, 9-0, reduction in demand. As you can see, we're losing economies of scale. We must deal with supply chain complexity, and we must assume the wastage risk and cost that the U.S. government used to assume. Moderna CEO Stefan Bansell before the Senate Health Committee. The committee chair is Senator Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont. And in his questions, he called Moderna greedy, pointing out the government gave the company billions of dollars to help develop the COVID-19 vaccine. And the company's shareholders have gotten very rich from its distribution so far. You're a multi-billionaire. Are the people, top executives on your company are multi-billionaires, all developed as a result of the vaccine. And now we have a situation where you are proposing to quadruple the price of the new, of the vaccine once the government stockpile runs out. That will mean that not only, and we'll talk about later on the patient assistance program, but in terms of government, in terms of Medicare, Medicaid, other government agencies, taxpayers are gonna have to spend substantially more money. My question to you, is given the fact that you have made billions of dollars, that your company has made huge profits on behalf of the taxpayers of this country, will you reconsider your decision to quadruple the price of the vaccine? So Chairman Sanders, what we have to do is to deal with the complexity I described, and I'm happy to go into more detail for this hearing. This is not the same product. We used to have 10 doses in each vial. Now we're going to have every but we'll have a different dose. This is not the same I understand that, but quadrupling the price is huge, and I will hope, I would hope very much that you will reconsider that decision. It's going to cost the taxpayers of this country billions of dollars. Is that something you can do? The volume we had during the pandemic gave us economies of scale we won't have anymore. That is what is different. Moderna CEO Stefan Bansell, questioned by Senator Bernie Sanders, chair of the Health Committee at today's hearing. The ranking 
Republican on the committee, Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. He's also a physician. During his opening statement, he said the current system, a partnership of government and private industry, works and needs to stay in place in the future if there's another threatening virus. It is important that through this hearing and otherwise that we do not send a hostile signal to future prospective partners that if you do something and you do it well and you profit, after it happens, we may come right back at you. You saved a million lives, but hey, buddy, we don't like your management decisions. We're coming back at you. That would mean a future company would not work closely with the government. They would run away from that quick response. Now, there are legitimate policy questions to ask how Moderna will price their vaccine post-commercialization. We're interested in that. We've never been in this situation before where a company has taken the reins back from the federal government after the federal government controlled distribution of the product. But this is not the time to discuss eliminating intellectual property rights or destroying business models of those whom our country will need to respond to the next pandemic and to develop the next life-changing cure. Senator Bill Cassidy, ranking Republican on the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee at today's hearing with the CEO of Moderna about the cost of the COVID-19 vaccine and a projected price index when the government stops buying the vaccine and instead it's distributed commercially. Reuters reports that Moderna in February forecasts significantly declining 2023 COVID-19 vaccine sales, which reached 184 billion dollars in 2022. Demand for the shots has declined sharply this year due to built-up product inventories around the world and increased population immunity from high rates of vaccination and previous infections. The Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, testifying today before the Senate Finance Committee on the President's budget request for health care programs for fiscal year 2023, which starts in October Senator Elizabeth Warren, Democrat from Massachusetts, asking about proposed changes to how the private insurance companies are paid to administer Medicare Advantage plans for seniors. Taxpayers pay these insurance companies a set amount per beneficiary, and this amount can go up if the beneficiary is sicker. The more diagnosis codes that a beneficiary has, the higher the payment. And whatever insurers don't spend on care, they actually get to keep. These companies have built entire businesses around making beneficiaries look as sick as possible. And unsurprisingly, government watchdogs have discovered widespread abuse. This year, CMS made a few updates to ensure that the government's payments more accurately reflect what it actually costs to pay for the care for beneficiaries in this program. And in response, the insurance industry has kicked into overdrive, sending an army of lobbyists to claim that the changes will hurt Medicare. So let's go through this. Let's start with the basics, Mr. Secretary. Under your proposal, will total payments to insurance plans that run Medicare Advantage go up or down? Total payments will go up. So they will go up. CMS is proposing to increase payments to MA plans next year. In other words, the insurance companies overall are going to get more taxpayer dollars, not fewer. But insurance companies want a lot more taxpayer dollars, not just a little more. So they're kicking and screaming, and they even shelled out millions of dollars for a primetime Super Bowl ad opposing the proposal. Now, these Medicare Advantage companies are also peddling industry-funded studies that claim Medicare premiums would go up and benefits would be cut if your proposal is finalized. Mr. Secretary, are those claims accurate? No, they are not. Benefits are not cut. Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra, questioned by Senator Elizabeth Warren at today's Finance Committee hearing. Axios has a story. American Action Network, the nonprofit issue advocacy arm of the Speaker Kevin McCarthy aligned Congressional Leadership Fund is running TV and digital ads attacking the Biden administration's efforts to claw back $4.7 billion from Medicare Advantage plans. The ads are running in districts of more than a dozen House Democrats that Republicans believe they can defeat in the 2024 elections. Here's one of those ads. 
How did D.C. liberals fund $200 billion for IRS and Green New Deal pet projects? By raiding our Medicare. Now President Biden's proposing massive Medicare Advantage cuts to seniors that could slash over $500 in benefits per retiree. While Biden breaks his promise to 30 million seniors who chose Medicare Advantage, Congresswoman Mary Peltola is silent. So we must speak. Tell Mary Peltola to protect Alaska seniors and stop Biden's Medicare benefit cuts. An ad sponsored by the group American Action Network, again affiliated with the Congressional Leadership Fund of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican from California. A Vox Media article this week says that almost half of people on Medicare, 31 million Americans, are now enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, nearly double the share of 10 years ago. And it's widely assumed that Medicare Advantage will cover a majority of the program's beneficiaries within the next few years. This is Washington Today. The governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, announcing today that the health clinic set up in East Palestine following the derailment last month of a freight train carrying toxic chemicals will be permanent and paid for by the railroad company that derailed, its train derailed, Norfolk Southern. Governor DeWine testifying remotely today to the U.S. Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee in Washington. He was at East Palestine High School in Ohio. Well, all the tests of the air and the soil and the water have thus far shown repeatedly that things are safe. Fear, fear remains. Uh, The people of East Palestine have told me that they want their community back. They want things to go back to the way they were before the train wreck. Uh, Members of the committee, Norfolk Southern has an obligation to restore this community. It was their train, their tracks. Their accident, they're responsible for this tragedy. I want to thank Senator Vance, Senator Brown, the other co-sponsors of their bill, uh, the Rail Safety Act of 2023. I want to also thank Congressman Johnson, Congresswoman Sykes for their bill, the Rail Act. I'm grateful uh, the drafters, both bills included my request for a provision requiring that the rail carriers in the future be required to provide advance notification to state and local emergency responders about what these trains are in fact carrying. Let me go further. Uh, I want, I urge the Senate and House to swiftly act to improve the safety, the safety of our railroads. Norfolk Southern must do everything in its power to put everything back as it was in East Palestine before 8.55 Friday, February 3rd. The people of this village have a right. They have a right to get their lives back. They have a right to get their community back and simply to get their peace of mind. Let me just add, if I could, one additional thing. Shortly uh, after the derailment, uh, I heard repeatedly from residents that they were concerned about their health. So we worked with the East Palestine community, with the health department and others, to create a clinic for the residents so they could be assessed immediately so they can walk in and and be cared for. Uh, We started that clinic shortly after this tragedy occurred. This morning in this library, I met with medical leaders from the East Liverpool City Hospital. And we are announcing today that we'll be making this clinic into a permanent clinic for the community. It's gonna be a full service clinic that will provide comprehensive care and treatment. Anybody can walk in, anyone can be treated. And this is a long-term commitment to the health of the people of East Palestine. Governor Mike DeWine, Republican from Ohio in East Palestine at the high school there, site of the trade and derailment, February 3rd, testifying remotely to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee, holding a hearing in Washington. Also testifying today in person in Washington, the CEO of Norfolk Southern Railroad, Alan Shaw, who The Washington Post report said in written testimony the railroad could back elements of safety legislation that lawmakers had proposed in the wake of the derailment and chemical spill. His testimony is silent on the most controversial proposal, a requirement that trains generally operate with a crew of at least two. Unions and the Biden administration argue that's a critical safety step, but the industry wants to experiment with other approaches and not have a standard locked in to federal law. That from the Washington Post. And still another witness today, again in person in Washington, East Palestine resident Misty Allison. She said she wanted to put a human face on this catastrophe. 
When authorities conducted a controlled burn, it was like a bomb went off, a bomb containing vinyl chloride, which releases dangerous chemicals. When burned, these chemicals never go away. Chemicals such as dioxins, which are not safe at any level, and cause damage that may not show up for years. Two days later, our government told us it was safe to come home. But is it safe? People and animals in my community are sick. The EPA tells us the data is fine, while independent researchers say that there are high levels of carcinogens all around us. Who do we trust? And then there's our mental health. The anxiety is real. My seven-year-old has asked me if he is going to die from living in his own home. What do I tell him? This preventable accident has put a scarlet letter on our town. People don't want to come here. Businesses are struggling. Our home values are plummeting. Even if we wanted to leave, we couldn't. Who would buy our homes? There were over a thousand train derailments last year. And the expansion of the petrochemical industry means that more trains carrying toxic chemicals will put more families at risk. Alan Shaw has repeatedly said that Norfolk Southern will make it right. But who determines what is right here? Misty Allison, resident of East Palestine, Ohio, in Washington, testifying before the Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. A reminder, you can find all the hearings that you hear on Washington Today in their entirety at our website, cspan.org. From CNN, cleanup of the toxic train derailment site in the Ohio town of East Palestine will likely take about three months, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency said on Friday. EPA Administrator Michael Regan said 6.8 million gallons of liquid waste and more than 5,400 tons of solid waste have already been transported to designated facilities. Washington Today continues in a moment. On Thursday, TikTok CEO Sho Z Chu testifies before the House Energy and Commerce Committee on privacy and data security practices, the platform's impact on kids, and its relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. Watch the hearing live Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3, C-SPAN Now, our free mobile video app, or online at cspan.org. And that hearing also live here on C-SPAN Radio, anywhere on your smart speaker. Say play C-SPAN Radio. Welcome back to Washington Today, which is available as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. This from Reuters, Russia blasted an apartment block in Ukraine with missiles on Wednesday after launching a swarm of drones at cities overnight, a deadly display of force following a solidarity visit by Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky tweeted security camera video of a residential apartment block in the southern city of Zaporizhia exploding as it was struck with a missile in broad daylight. And this from the Associated Press, China on Wednesday said President Xi Jinping's just concluded visit to Russia was a journey of friendship, cooperation and peace and again criticized Washington for providing military support to Ukraine. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken testifying today before the U.S. Senate Appropriations Subcommittee that covers the State Department and foreign operations. Senator Susan Collins, Republican of Maine, asking him about the ongoing debate within the Republican Party about whether to continue aiding Ukraine. There are those who view our support of Ukraine as an either-or proposition for our national security. And they argue that either the United States focuses on pushing back Russian aggression in Ukraine, or the United States focuses on countering the rising influence of China. I don't agree with that assessment. I view the two challenges as interconnected and believe that Russia and China are working in concert to reshape the international order to our disadvantage. Two questions for you. First, what message would it send to China and Russia were we to abandon Ukraine at this point? And second, please articulate the case 
for why our involvement in Ukraine is in America's national interest. Um, Madam Vice Chair, thank you very much for that question. First of all, I fully agree with you. Um, and let me put it this way, um, because it does go, uh, and it's, in effect, the second part of your question actually goes right to the, uh, to the first part. Why is this in our interest? Why is it in, profoundly in the interest of the United States to do what we've been doing, which is to continue to stand with Ukraine as it defends itself against this Russian aggression, to continue to exert pressure on Russia to uh, end the aggression, and to strengthen our own alliance, defensive alliance, NATO, in case that aggression spreads? It's two reasons. Fundamentally, first of all, I think uh, Americans do not like to see um, big nations bullying smaller ones. That's something that uh, sticks in our craw, and uh, we see the horrific abuses and atrocities that are being committed, and that's something that I think Americans um, focus on very intensely. But fundamentally, the reason is this. Um, if we allow the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine to go forward with impunity, um, if we allow the very basic rules of the road for how countries relate to one another that were established after two world wars and that focus, among other things, on making sure that countries respect the territorial integrity of other countries, respect their independence, uh, respect their sovereignty. If we allow that to be violated with impunity by Russia and Ukraine, we open a Pandora's box around the world where would-be aggressors everywhere look at this and say, if they can get away with it, I can too. And that is a world of conflict. Uh, that is a world of war. That is a world that we've been in before. And we've had to come in and do something about it. But it's not a world that we want. So the stakes in Ukraine go well beyond Ukraine. And to your point, I think it, um, it has a profound impact in Asia, uh, for example. Everyone is watching to see how we and the world responds to this aggression. And they'll draw their lessons from it. One of the reasons that there are so many um, partners involved in this from Asia is precisely because even though this is happening half a world away, they see the stakes for them. One of the leading countries in our coalition to support Ukraine is Japan. South Korea is playing an important role. Australia is too, uh, and they see the stakes. I think if China is looking at this, and they are looking at it very carefully, they will draw lessons for how the world comes together or doesn't to stand up to this aggression. Secretary of State Antony Blinken before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee that covers the State Department and Foreign Operations, questioned by Senator Susan Collins of Maine, who is ranking member on the full Appropriations Committee. The secretary also saying that he did not believe that China has been providing lethal aid to Russia. He said, as we speak today, we have not seen them cross that line. New York Times reports the International Monetary Fund and Ukraine have reached a preliminary agreement on a $15.6 billion loan to help the country close staggering budget deficits and recover from widespread damage to its infrastructure from Russian attacks, the lender said today. Secretary Blinken also getting questions about the U.S.-Mexico border and drug trafficking. Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican from South Carolina, has introduced legislation. He did it after the recent kidnapping of four Americans in Mexico by a drug cartel and the murder of two of those Americans to designate Mexican drug cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. Senator Graham is the ranking Republican on this appropriations subcommittee. Do you believe our policies toward drug cartels and fentanyl coming from Mexico, that those policies are working? Uh, they, they, need to, they need to do more. They need to be more effective. Here's one way we can do that. Okay. One way we can do that is making sure that we have, for example, the technology on our borders uh, to uh, detect and intercept the fentanyl. 96% of the fentanyl coming to the United States is coming through legal ports of entry. We have the technology that can catch a lot of that. Yeah. We need to deploy it faster. Well, That's exactly How about this idea? Rather than just interdicting at the border, we go to the source and declare Mexican drug cartels foreign terrorist organizations under U.S. law. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that? Uh, yes, we'd certainly consider that. And I that would help us with China because if you provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization, mm -hmm. you could be prosecuted in U.S. courts. There are also transnational criminal organizations, and that brings with it uh, That's what they are today. I yeah, want and up, that, I want it's not clear to me that the... Uh, again, that we would get additional tools or authorities. It's worth pointing we out. We would with it, China, Mr. Secretary. TCOs cannot, material support doesn't bring you in U.S. courts. FTO, mm -hmm. material support for an FTO would capture you in U.S. courts if you're a China company. Mm -hmm. So please consider that. I would say our policy is not working. I want to introduce a map. This is travel advisory map. Of the State Department tells you where to go and not to go in Mexico. The red is getting redder. And... Um, 
Ms. Secretary, uh, enough with Mexico. Obrador is going to call um, Chi. Great. I'm not looking for a phone call from Mexico. I'm looking for action on their part. I'm willing to do a planned Colombia-type effort with Mexico, but I'm going to put the Mexican government on notice and your department. When it comes to the poisoning of America, we're going to take different action because what we're doing is not working. Senator Lindsey Graham, ranking Republican on the Appropriations Subcommittee overseeing the State Department and Foreign Aid, questioning the witness today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken. The State Department's Bureau of Counterterrorism has a list of all the groups officially labeled foreign terrorist organizations. There are 68 of them. And besides what Senator Graham mentioned, where you can bring cases in U.S. court, prosecuting people who provide material support to these groups. Treasury Department can also freeze their assets, and they can be entry prevented to the U.S. by group members and removal from the U.S. of non-citizen members. The Supreme Court, writes CNN, delved into the complexities of federal trademark law in a case concerning a poop-themed dog toy that resembles a Jack Daniels bottle at times erupting into laughter as the justices explored how much protection should be given to parodists that rip off trademarks they don't own. At the center of the case is a bad Spaniel's Silly Squeaker toy created by VIP products that is strikingly similar to a Jack Daniels bottles. The distiller sued the company over the toy, which is replete with scatological humor, claiming it violated federal trademark law, which usually centers on how likely a consumer is to confuse an alleged infringement with something produced by the true owner of the mark. That's from CNN. C-SPAN covered the oral argument today. Here is Justice Samuel Alito questioning Lisa Scavo Blatt, attorney for Jack Daniels, about whether consumers really are confused. Could any reasonable person think that Jack Daniels had approved this use of the mark? Um, absolutely. That's, that's, that's why we won below. Really? Yes, but... Uh, let me uh, envision this scene. Pr- uh, somebody in Jack Daniels comes to the CEO and says, <clears throat> I have a great idea for a product that we're going to produce. It's going to be a dog toy, and it's going to have a label that looks a lot like our label, and it's going to have a name that looks a lot like our name, Bad Spaniels, and... What's going to be in, supportedly, in this dog toy is dog urine. You think the CEO is going to say, that's a great idea. We're going to produce that thing. No, but Nationwide ran a Super Bowl commercial with a dead child in it, and they had to pull it because it was such a bad idea. I don't know who approved that one. It was really embarrassing for them. So a reasonable person would would not think that Jack Daniels had approved this. I think if you're selling urine, you're probably going to win on a motion to, I mean, on a 12B6, but you're probably also violating some state law. But sure. The, no, no, it you're not selling urine. It's exactly oh, this you, oh, toy. I'm sorry, I thought it was. No, no it's, it's exactly this toy. Urine. I'm sorry. Which purportedly <laughs> contains some oh. sort of dog excrement oh, I'm or sorry. urine. Okay, my bad. The CEO is, the CEO is going to say, this is a great idea. Well, just showing how confused I was suggests that I would be your perfect consumer. Justice Alito, I don't know how old you are, but you went to law school. You're very smart. You're analytical. You have hindsight bias. And well, maybe I went you know to something. a law school where I didn't learn any law. So no. Okay, but it's just a little rich for people who are at your level to, to say that you know what the average purchasing public thinks about all kinds of female products that you don't know anything about about or dog toys that you might not know anything about. And so I, I just... I don't know. I had a dog. I know something about dogs. The, okay. the question is not what the average person would think. It's whether there should be, this should be a reasonable person standard to oh. simplify this whole thing. So since 1976, you've had this appreciable or substantial number of confusion. And again, I think the best example is just you can enact a rule that says likelihood of confusion by judges or likelihood of deception. And if you think that's the average reasonable judge, okay. But I don't know how you would do a survey on that. Attorney Lisa Scavo Blatt representing Jack Daniels Properties in the oral argument In the case today, Jack Daniels v. VIP Products, which is the maker of the dog toy in question. Justice Alito also saying he has concerns about violating the First Amendment free speech rights of VIP Products. Justice Elena Kagan asked VIP Products lawyer Bennett Cooper what was so funny about the bad Spaniels toy and other dog toys sold by the company. What is the parody here? (laughs) The parody? 
The yeah. parody is I, I, of... I, maybe I just have no sense of humor, but... <laughs> What's the parody? The, the parody is multifold, but the, the testimony indicates, and it's not been disputed, that the parody is to make fun of marks that take themselves seriously. Well, I mean, you say that, but you, you know, you make fun of a lot of marks. Doggy Walker, Dos Peros, Smella Arpa, <laughs> Canine Cola, Mountain Drool, are all of these companies taking themselves too seriously? Yeah, yes, in fact. You don't see a I mean, parody just like as, as a soft bird. drinks and liquor, as, uh, companies all, take themselves too seriously as a class? I think there are a lot of products that take them too seriously, as seriously and merchandise. You don't see, for example, something near, near to my heart, a parody of Woodford Reserve bourbon, because you don't get that building up of an edifice of making them into a, an iconic, a cultural icon and reference point. When you advertise on TV incessantly and you create this image of yourself as something that's so important. So you're just saying anytime you go out after or you use the mark of a large company, it's a parody, just by definition. Because well, well, they must be they must take themselves too seriously because they're a big company. I, I think as applied here, there's no doubt that Jack Daniels takes itself very seriously. Well, I don't know. I don't think Stella Artois takes itself very seriously. And they, they have would, very funny commercials. Yeah, and I've seen their historical commercials, and they would honor parody too. But Jack Daniels is at the head of the line. I mean, this is a, okay. I've made my point. Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan questioning Bennett Cooper, attorney for VIP Products. The Supreme Court is expected to issue a decision in this case. Jack Daniels Properties v. VIP Products by the end of the term in June. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson testifying today before the. Parliament's Committee of Privileges about claims that he knowingly lied to the House of Commons when he repeatedly said that COVID-19 guidance, social distancing, etc., was being followed at 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister's residence and office complex. This is the so-called Partygate scandal. A CNN article called it a four-hour grilling that could spell the beginning of the end of his political career. Boris Johnson saying today he did not mislead Parliament. There were a number of uh, days over a period of 20 months when gatherings took place in Downing Street that went past the point where they could be said to be necessary for work purposes. That was wrong. I bitterly regret it. I understand public anger and I continue to apologise for what happened on my watch and I take full responsibility. But as you've just said, Chair, the purpose of this inquiry is not to reopen so-called party gate. It is to discover whether or not I lied to Parliament, wittingly misled colleagues and the country about what I knew and believed about those gatherings when I said that the rules and the guidance had been followed at number 10. I am here to say to you, hand on heart, that I did not lie to the House. When those statements were made, they were made in good faith and on the basis of what I honestly knew and believed at the time. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the start of a multi-hour hearing by the British Privileges Committee investigating whether Boris Johnson had potentially lied to Parliament. As for what happens next, this is from BBC News. The Privileges Committee will now consider the former Prime Minister's testimony as well as the other evidence it's reviewed over the course of the inquiry. The committee is expected to publish its verdict on Boris Johnson by the summer. Its findings will conclude whether or not Boris Johnson deliberately or recklessly misled the House of Commons, and if so, whether this was a contempt. If the committee finds against Boris Johnson, it will recommend what it considers to be the appropriate sanction. Then the whole House of Commons will debate the report and decide whether to accept or reject it before members of Parliament have a free vote on the matter. That from BBC News. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. Subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night.